This is episode number 60 of the Fine Dining Podcast. Welcome to Portsmouth, Rhode Island. This is the Find Dining Podcast. The Find Dining Podcast. For foodies who love travel and travelers who love food. Here's your host, Seth Ressler. Hello and welcome to the Fine Dining Podcast. I'm your host. My name is Seth Ressler and this is the podcast for foodies who love travel and travelers who love food. Each week we go to a different city and we talk to somebody about the local food scene, find out what's going on there. And so this week we're actually talking to Greg Fatigati of Fatigati's Fresh Pasta. He's also on the board of directors of Hope in Maine, which is a kitchen incubator, and we're going to talk to him about that. Greg, thank you so much for joining us. Seth, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. All right, so we're doing things a little different in this episode of the podcast because we're, we're not necessarily talking about a region. We're talking about all the things that uh, you're involved in because you're involved in a bunch of cool projects. But before we get into those, I know that you've got a trivia question for me. Uh, yes, see if anybody can tell us how the... Uh Tortellini was invented, how the shape of the tortellini was actually uh, uh, created. You're a pasta guy, I know. So, tortellini. I am. How did the tortellini get its shape? Let me, uh, hmm, I don't know off the top of my head, so let me think about that, and we're going to come back to that question. Okay. Greg, uh, let's talk about some of the things that you've been involved with. I mean, you've been involved with the Culinary Institute of America, which everybody knows is uh, CIA. Uh, you've now got Fatigati's Fresh Pasta over there in Portsmouth, Rhode Island. Tell me about how you got into food in the first place. I mean, let's start here. You were born. Then what happened? I grew up in Pittsburgh, and my family had a restaurant in Pittsburgh for 72 years called Fatigati's. So I guess it was kind of inevitable that uh, was the path I uh, I took. You know, my uh, I say on my website uh, at the very young age, you know, when about 12 or 13 is when my grandmother actually allowed me to stand beside her at the pasta machine. I was in the kitchen with my father, my grandparents, uh, my brothers, sisters. It was just a great environment for me to work, uh, grow up in, I'm having the whole family there. And, uh, you know, my grandmother showed me the techniques of making pasta. My father showed me the discipline of being a chef. And my mother was the one that showed me that there was other cultures and foods other than just being Italian. So this is really like a family affair? I mean, this is something generation after generation after generation. I am actually fourth generation. Wow. I had a great-grandfather who was chef for the king of Italy. Really? Uh, yep. Then my grandmother, and then my father, and then now me. That's some uh, big shoes to fill there. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, especially my father, he was a special individual. Graduate of Notre Dame, spent his time in the State Department, and uh, then came back to Pittsburgh to take over the family business. So uh, following my father was not necessarily easy. Right, right. I'm sure, now, is the restaurant still going in Pittsburgh? No, no, my dad retired in, uh, in 92, sold the restaurant to somebody else. So after growing up in this family... Then what? I mean, did you go and work in the family business for a while? Did you ever go to get a culinary education? I graduated from the Culinary Institute, and uh, it was my mother who gave me the idea. She said, you know, I know you don't like winter, so uh, you should look at doing your summers in New England and going south for the winter. And that's pretty much what I did for about eight years. I would do my summers on Cape Cod, and then I'd head down to Naples, Florida for the wintertime. And in between, then, I, I ended up doing uh, some stages in Italy uh, for uh, Andrea De Marano at Villa Mozart for about a year. And then uh, back in the mid-'80s, Tony May, a New York restaurateur, brought him into uh, New York City. And uh, I spent some time with Andrea uh, at uh, Palio, which was the restaurant he opened there. And then from there, I went to the Culinary Institute and uh, did my first teaching stint. I went out, started a, another restaurant concept, and got into the private club business, the golf resort business, and then came back to the culinary in, in 2000 as a faculty member, and then ended up being the associate dean for culinary arts. Talk to me about the world of culinary education. I mean, if somebody is a prospective student, is thinking about going into this as a career, first of all, are there other options besides being a chef? There are. My wife is a perfect example. She started out in the industry cooking. Uh, she's now director of uh, uh, recruiting and training for Legal Seafoods Corporation here in Boston. So there's a lot of different avenues. I have students. Francis Lamb comes to mind, a great student. He is a freelance writer. Uh, last I heard, he was with Salon.com writing. I had students go on to get PhDs 
and go into research and development. So it, but they all need that foundation of good sound culinary training, and they need to spend some time in the kitchen. Now, all of them, I think, will tell you that. But it's really dramatically changed. I mean, the Food Network has been acid and liability, and uh, I graduated with Susan Feniger and, and Sarah Moulton. We would have these conversations all the time. I said, you know, you guys are great. What you're doing, we appreciate it. We've got, you know, you brought so much attention to the profession. But there are students who really don't get a realistic view. You know, they watch it on TV and it becomes glamorized. Right. So it's helped bring the profession to the forefront. You know, when I used to go home from break when I was in school, my friends would would make fun of me for what I was doing. You know, and now look what's happened. So it's really evolved. So let's talk about that for a moment, because there is this thing where there's been this celebritization. I don't know if that's an actual word of the chef. And I remember thinking, you know, just a month ago, I went up to San Francisco to watch a butcher cut up a pig. And there were, you know, it was a Tuesday night, and there were 40 of us gathered around to to watch this. And when I was a kid, you know, a butcher was what Alice's boyfriend on the Brady Bunch did. The people who prepare the food, uh, who grow the food or raise the food, uh, have become celebrities in the last decade or two, right? Yeah, it's it's the European slow food model. I always used to tell students, nobody's doing anything new. It still has to be broiled, baked, sautéed, grilled. You know, those fundamentals still exist. And what you're seeing happen here in this country is, you know, what's been going on in Europe and other countries for God knows how many, many years. We finally realizing that the word terroir has uh, some real meaning. And the locality of sourcing ingredients is really now coming to play. The challenge is you get that customer who wants asparagus in the middle of January. <laughs> yeah. I mean, people have lost a, a sense of, you know, what is in season when. Correct. That's very, very true. But, you know, the large chains, they do that. So then they come to your place and say, well, I had it over there last week. Why can't I get it from you? And you say, well, you know, we have a different viewpoint of how we present our food and what we do. It's tough because, you know, you're trying to balance that versus uh, being financially viable as a company. Sure. Uh, It is a challenge. Are there other skills that people, you know, particularly people who want to, say, open up their own restaurant or operate their own business, obviously they need uh, some other business skills. Correct. Is there also a new set of skills that people need? I mean, to be a super successful chef at this point, do you need public speaking skills? I mean, now that, you know, there is the Food Network and things like that as a portion of it, are there other things like that that people need to be good at? You know, communication is is a big part of it, but I always stress that it's not being able to speak. It's being able to listen to what your customers and your guests are telling you and then having the flexibility to respond very quickly. You know, when I first started out, chefs never walked out of the kitchen. Let's be honest. (laughs) There were some times when you didn't want them walking out of the kitchen. (laughs) But that's all changed today. So people want to see the chef, the table's in the kitchen all those types of things, but communication, being able to um, uh, speak to your customers and communicate and and, and present yourself uh, because you are the brand. You know, I think that's the big thing that the chefs have realized. They are the brand today. And especially now that you've seen the explosion of social media as well, you know, you've got these food bloggers who are following particular personalities. Correct. And know where they go and what restaurants they open. And I, I mean, people keep track of oh, this chef started here and started under this person and, and moved there and then trained there. and Pretty soon we'll have trading cards, I think. You know what? So I come <laughs> from the world of alternative rock, and this actually reminds me quite a bit of the alternative rock explosion that you saw in the 90s. Right. The Food Network being sort of the MTV, you know, and the way that all those bands just had a grassroots following and went around touring and, and, you know, became celebrities. That's, I see a lot of parallels to what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree with that statement. I like to think of the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference as the warped tour of (laughs) the culinary world. That's what, that's what I'm aiming for. (laughs) I hope you're very successful. So let's talk about uh, uh, your latest venture, Fatigati's Fresh Pasta. This is over in Portsmouth, Rhode Island, right? Correct. So tell me uh, why you opened up shop there and what you're doing. You know, I've always been fascinated by pasta. You know, I always used to tell students the simpler the ingredients, the more the technique becomes the issue. 
And when you look at pasta, you know, eggs, flour, salt, that's it. But how you handle it, humidity, the technique of how you make it, it always fascinated me. You know, and I think it just goes back. For me, it's always been comfort food. I go back to those days as a kid with my father and my grandparents in the kitchen, and I've just always had a real fascination with pasta. I found this location in Portsmouth. I realized that I could convert it into this fresh pasta shop, and um, that's what I did. I have a lot of moving parts here. I do fresh pasta, cut to order. I have prepared meals that my customers can come in and pick up and heat up at home at their leisure. I have a takeaway menu. I have a small retail section, and I also do uh, an Italian deli with uh, imported meats and cheeses. Oh, wow. So you've got a lot going on there. I have a lot going on. You know, we always always have at least four or five flavored doughs. Besides our egg dough, we've got um, spinach today, spinach spaghetti, squid ink, wild mushroom, tomato, garlic, rosemary dough. And we do, uh, I don't make it here, but I do have a source for fresh gluten-free pasta, which is uh, really high in demand. I, I can't make it here because I would have to sanitize my entire shop. Sure. So it's just easier for me to purchase it. Right. You know, let's let somebody do what they're good at, and I'll do what I'm good at. Now, talk to me about fresh pasta, uh, particularly for the person who is so used to getting their spaghetti out of a box. Talk to me about the differences. I mean, I mean, what makes fresh pasta great? Um, well, first, it's, it will have an, an egg product in it. And it's interesting. You talk about, and I learned a very hard lesson. I was open just a couple of days, and somebody came in and bought a couple of pounds of pasta and then called me about a half an hour later and said it was the worst thing they ever had. And I said, well, did you overcook it? And they logged pause on the phone, and they said, we didn't know we had to cook it. <laughs> because they, they, they had always gotten pasta out of the box. Right. You know, so I said, you know, assumptions, the motherhood of our, you know, screw-ups. So I started handing out cooking instructions for a while. But um, fresh pasta, you know, nothing like it. The dough has a lot more elasticity. It takes on the flavor of the salt when you salt the water, I think, more. It takes on the flavor of the sauce more. You know, and then obviously it's the cooking time. It cooks in two or three minutes, depending on what size and thickness of cut uh, that you're doing. But pasta has a functionality, and you know, I, I have to ask my customers when they come in, when they uh, ask for sauce, so are you eating the Italian way or the American way? And the Italian way is just enough sauce. The pasta is supposed to carry the sauce. That's its function. You know, and if they say it the American way, then we give them a lot more sauce on pasta. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, for somebody who is uh, sort of new to the world of pasta, walk me through some of the different types. Walk me through some of the different uh, dishes and some of the different pastas you would use with different sauces. Uh, where do you start? As I said earlier, it's a, the pasta really is a functional part of the dish. It's designed to carry the sauce and hold the sauce. So rigatoni, for example, or penne, as a lot of people know it, or friselli or... Uh, you know, the hollow shape, it's designed to hold sauce inside uh, the pasta. So when you eat it, you have a nice mixture of sauce and pasta. Broad, flat noodles like pappardelle or fettuccine or tagliatelle are designed to be served with cream sauces. There's the starch of the pasta on the outside takes on and, and it's easily coated with the cream sauce. Or just butter and cheese. Tortellonis or tortellinis are designed to, you know, have a filling like a ravioli. Uh, I was at the, if you ever get a chance in your travels, go to the Pasta Museum in Bologna, Italy, and you'll see literally hundreds of different shapes and sizes of pasta. Pasta, when we say pasta, Seth, we're talking about fresh. In Italian verbiage, macaroni would be the dried variations of pasta. Uh, 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 and I can't even bring myself to use pasta. They call it macaroni. Right, right. Those are always extruded. And they usually don't have eggs in them. They're just made with semolina and warm water and a little bit of salt. So you're telling me just about everything I see on the grocery store shelf is actually macaroni. In Italian culture, that would be classified broadly as macaroni. Gotcha. Right. I dried. You know, every uh, 28 different regions in Italy, 28 different dialects. You know, the ravioli, as you know it, up north in northern region may be called an annuletti somewhere else. or It depends on what it's served with what's inside of it sometimes. So that's where you get all these hundreds of different variations of pasta. And it can be uh, confusing. You know, people come in and ask for this, and 
And I said, well, describe it to me. Oh, no, I have that, it's, but this is what I call it, because that's the region of Italy I'm from. So I can usually determine where somebody's heritage comes from Italy by what they're asking in a pasta. Huh. So when you sit down to teach students about pasta, I mean, what are some of the first things that you tell them, and, and what are some of the secrets to making great pasta? We use a very high-protein flour in semolina. Uh, it's usually between 16 and 18 percent protein. Why that's important is because if you mix it and overwork it too much and don't allow it to relax, it will come up very tough, and, uh, and that's just because of the structure of the flour. You know, eggs are important. They're one of the things that you'll never get in this country, when you go to Italy, you see the fresh pasta has a really almost orangish hue to it. And that's because the chickens, the yolks of the eggs over there are fed differently. Just have, they have this deep orange color to them. And that's why when you look at pictures of pasta in Italy and books, the color's so vibrant. The closest I've come to in this country with eggs that match are duck eggs. Okay. But people get a little squeamish when you, if you start making pasta with duck eggs. So, uh, And we have a lot more health and food safety concerns. So uh, I here at the shop, I have to use pasteurized eggs. I can't use fresh eggs. So those are some of the things we talk about. You know, the debate always is, is there olive oil in the pasta dough or not in the pasta dough? But really working the dough and you really have to, um, it's again, it's the technique becomes the issue because there's so few ingredients. It's kind of hard to teach a student uh, right off the bat how the dough should feel. You try to give them some indications by pulling it apart and showing them uh, and then allowing it to rest. And then humidity, when you're running it through the machine, depending on the time of the year, it may need more flour worked into it. It may need to be dried longer. These are all the little nuances that you have to teach a student about pasta. Now, talk to me about sort of regional differences in pasta. I mean, not just in Italy, but uh, are there different pastas from around the world? And, and what are some of the differences? Um, you know, if you go into the Asian countries, you obviously see uh, rice flour being used more in Mediterranean cooking in the Far East. You'll see chickpea flour. You'll see, you know, look at orzo. That's a semolina, but it's, uh, it's cut into a different shape. You'll see potato flour used uh, in different pastas around the world, too. Uh, you know, some of the earliest books I've read, you know, I'll point to uh, the Italians had a great knack for traveling the world finding something, bringing it back to their country, and making everybody believe it was theirs. That's a good trick. <laughs> it is. It's a great trick. I mean, tomatoes aren't indigenous to Italy. They were brought back from this country. Really? But when you say, yeah, when you say Italian cuisine, what's the first thing a lot of people think of? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's a tomato. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, pasta really had, uh, the noodle had its roots in Asia. And you look at different cultures, everybody's got a stuffed pasta of some sort, or close to it. You know, the Polish and the Ukrainians have a pierogi. So the Chinese do their different styles of dumplings. And you'll see, go to, you know, and then you go throughout the Far East, you'll see the different styles of dumplings. So they all have something very similar. Now, what's your favorite style? You know, I, I still like a nice fettuccine cut and just a good extra virgin olive oil, some cracked pepper and cheese, because I like to taste the pasta. That does sound like it would show it off. Yeah, absolutely. I'm all about the pasta more than the sauce. All right, well, we could talk about pasta every day, but we've got uh, a couple of other things that we got to talk about here. Uh, so we're going to come back in just a second. We are going to get an answer to your trivia question. Okay. We're going to find out, uh, how, you know, how the shape of the tortellini came about. Uh, we are also going to talk about uh, Hope in Maine, which is this great kitchen incubator that you're involved with. And uh, then we're going to play a game called Out of the Frying Pan. So that's coming up in just a sec. Okay, we've officially wrapped up the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference. So many people to thank for making that such a fantastic event that happened a couple of weeks ago in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, including Hope and Maine. They were one of the sponsors of the event. We were uh, very excited to have them. You're going to hear about all the exciting things that they're doing as a kitchen incubator space in just a sec. I do want to let you know that if you head over to the Taste Trekkers website, a couple of things. First of all, you can see uh, photos and an entire recap of the conference uh, composed of tweets, and you can hear... Uh, uh, Matt Jennings uh, keynote address and all sorts of other things uh, right there at tastetrekkers.com slash conference. The other thing is that if you head over to tastetrekkers.com, you will actually see on the right side a link 
that allows you to leave a voicemail that we can then play on this podcast. So if you want to leave us a message, we'll play them back in this podcast. Go ahead and just click the link there, click the button, uh, head over and uh, leave a message right from your computer and we'll, we'll air you on this podcast. You could be a celebrity. Wouldn't that be huge? People come up to you at parties, ask you for your autograph. It'll be awesome. So uh, leave a message. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much. We are talking to Greg Fatigati. He's got Fatigati's Fresh Pasta in Portsmouth. Uh, he's also been uh, involved with the Culinary Institute of America in many, many ways over the years. And he is on the board of directors of the Hope and Main Kitchen Incubator that is uh, coming soon to uh, Rhode Island. We're going to talk about that. But before we do, I know I asked you a trivia question. Tell me again, what is it? Where did the shape of the tortellini originate from? Where did the shape of the tortellini originate from? Just so that everybody can visualize it, the tortellini is sort of the uh, ring-shaped pasta. Correct. Okay, it kind of looks like a belly button. Uh, there you go. That's the answer. And uh, there's two stories of lore out there. One is that a chef working for a very wealthy uh, Alta Borghese household uh, was so enamored with a, with a wife that he created the tortellini, the shape of her belly button, in tribute to her. And the other story is that uh, it was created by Italian chefs to represent the belly button of Venus, the goddess of love. It is literally belly button pasta. Yep, and, you know, the big conversation is, is in any or outy, so <laughs> you have to stop. <laughs> it is a little hard to tell, isn't it? <laughs> it is, it is, so. I guess the good news is she didn't have any lint that day. <laughs> I don't know, if there's too much flour on it. Yeah, that's true, that's true. Okay, so let's talk about this project, Hope in Maine, and, and uh, first of all, tell me what it is. Uh, Hope in Maine is, a, uh, is actually the uh, brainchild of uh, Lisa Rioli and Waterman Brown. They're really the driving force behind it. And they saw a need in Rhode Island for this concept that's been replicated around the country known as incubator kitchens. And what they are in its purest sense is we're going to build commercial kitchens that somebody who wants to take a food product uh, to market can rent the kitchen space from us and actually put their product into production. We'll help them with storage and we'll help them with distribution. So this sounds to me like there are these business incubators that a lot of entrepreneurs use where they all get together and sort of have shared office space. This is the same thing applied to people who need a kitchen, right? Exactly the same thing. How many of these are there around the country? We just recently read a report done by a company out of Philadelphia, a research firm, and they confirmed that there's 140 in existence throughout the United States. Wow. Hope and Maine would be the first one in Rhode Island. So this is something that I would use, for example, if I just graduated from the Culinary Institute of America or just graduated from Johnson & Wales and I were looking to start my own business, perhaps? And that's exactly one of the clients we may have. Uh, it might be somebody who's trained professionally. It might be somebody who always had a knack for cooking or whose mother made something that everybody liked that they think is a, uh, a product that could be very successful in market. It could also be uh, an existing restaurateur or caterer who from time to time needs to rent some extra kitchen space for a large party or function that they have. Gotcha. So big food festival that comes through or something like that, you need to gear up. So we're not just talking about, for example, chefs at restaurants, but it could also be artisanal food producers or somebody putting together uh, some sort of packaged food product? Correct. The, um, the big users, from what I understand around the country, are food trucks right now. They need places to produce their product, and uh, they really don't have access to commercial kitchens. Obviously, you know, you've read there's a lot of friction between food trucks and brick-and-mortar restaurant owners, so I'm sure they're having a difficult time approaching a brick-and-mortar restaurant saying, hey, can I have some kitchen space <laughs> so I can park in front of your restaurant <laughs> at, at noon? Right. That's interesting. I, because one of the things I was wondering was whether this competed with food trucks in some ways, because food trucks have been a really nice, low-cost entry point for a lot of people, you know, looking to get into the sort of the hospitality and food service industry. But you're saying that they could use the incubator space and pair the two together. Correct. Because certain uh, cities have, re health departments have restrictions about food being prepared in somebody's home. You know, with the HACCP certification and those types of things, it's hard to get a uh, kitchen in, a, in somebody's private home uh, certified. So this definitely is a big asset uh, for them to have. 
access to. So where is the Hope and Main project at this point? Building was purchased. Contract was awarded to construction company. And they actually, we were probably through the permitting process right now through, with the general contractor and all the subcontractors. So the first phase of construction, from what I understand, will be the elevator that we have to install. So um, it's now going to move very fast. We are finishing the uh, application process, so we will be able to get the application online very soon for a uh, candidate. And uh, we're really a f- kind of a full service. We're going to help them create their business plan. They'll be able to tie in with the Rhode Island Small Business Association and go through them if they qualify and be able to get some monies through them. They have to bring certain things to the table first. They have to be serve safe certified. They have to have a proof of liability insurance. Some cases, depending on the product, they may have to have a label approved by the uh, USDA. But you really offering, you know, much more than just a kitchen there. Correct. We will stand or fall on the success or failure of our incubators. It's important that we make them successful right from the beginning. And this, by the way, and I'll tell you this as an entrepreneur, and you know this as well, that quite often it's the other things besides sort of the main thing that you do that can be tricky and that can trip you up. Absolutely. There's a great book for entrepreneurs called The E-Myth Revisited, and that's one of the things, you know, tells a story about, you know, a guy who, he's a great plumber, he works for a plumbing company, and he says, I'm the best plumber here, why do I, you know, all my money goes to the plumbing company, I'm going to go start my own plumbing company. And he thinks that all there is to starting a plumbing company is being a plumber. And it turns out, no, you got to be able to manage people and take care of the legal stuff and, and, and handle sales and, and billing and all that. So you guys actually help with a lot of those sort of other aspects besides just... We will. We will even help them initially through the distribution process and channels. Oh, that's key. That's key. Uh, when are you looking to open up the doors? I mean, when are you looking to have your first you know, applicants in there? Actually, we would have applicants in the queue before we actually finish the kitchen because you know, there's a lot of things behind the scenes like that we were just talking about that they have to have in place. You know, they have to get purveyors lined up, um, packaging lined up. So there's a lot of things that they can have. So we, I believe the uh, plan, if everything worst case scenario, would be uh, late spring to have our first incubus uh, actually turning on burners in the kitchen. Oh, okay. So that's soon. Yep. We're going to put the application online probably in late September. Okay. And, and we will start ex- evaluating applications uh, probably uh, shortly after that. And how many kitchens are you going to have there? We're going to start off with two full kitchens and then one cold prep area because we realized, you know, why tie up a uh, commercial kitchen space with somebody standing there and having to do a lot of mise en place, cutting vegetables or things like that. So um, the kitchens will be for actual cooking. And then they'll have uh, an area next to there adjacent to the kitchens where they can do all their mise en place work. All the plumbing and electrical and, and HVAC will be in that cold prep area. And when we need it, then we can convert that space into a third kitchen. So let's say I'm, I got my cupcake food truck idea that I want to get up and off the ground. I've applied. I'm into the program. What does it look like? Do I reserve hours, you know, a certain times of the day or, or a certain day a week? Or I kind of make the analogy to uh, I have a great ballroom and I'm in the middle of the wedding season. So everybody wants to get married on Saturday. So we will have different rates for incubies based on prime time. And obviously, in the middle of the day, probably from 9 until 2 or 3 is when a lot of people will want to be in there. Incubies will have their own key. So it's a come and go. They'll be able to come and go. We'll, they'll have to schedule through us, but they will have access to the building. You might be a, somebody who has, a, who has to do donuts or bread or something, so you're going to want to be in there at 2 or 3 in the morning. And how many uh, tenants can you have at any one given time? What do, you, what do you call them? What do you call the people who are in this space? Incubies. Okay, that, that's a good word. I like that. How many incubies can you have at any one uh, given we're time? We're hoping to have 40 in the queue. Oh, wow. Okay, that's a lot. You know, because they're not all going to be doing massive production, you know, initially. So uh, talking to other incubies uh, around the country, 40 seems to be a, a manageable number for the size of kitchens that we're planning on constructing. The model for Hope and Maine, is this a nonprofit organization? We are nonprofit. Well, people want to find out more about it. Where can they go? They can just Google Hope in Maine and Warren, Rhode Island, and it'll come up. 
All right, kitchen incubator. I like this idea. We're going to have some some cool stuff coming out of there. I think so, you know. Um, I'm sure we're going to see a piece of an idea that we can take with an incubator and, and, and tweak it a little bit and turn it into something that they can be very successful with. Do chefs and food producers, it just seems like they have more tools uh, at their disposal and there's more avenues towards creating interesting things between food trucks and food network and social media and incubator spaces like this. It, it seems like there's a lot of opportunity these days. There is, and the manufacturing process has gotten quite sophisticated. The products that you have available to you have become uh, quite good. You know, for example, uh, here in my shop, when I make spinach dough, it's a powder. It's a concentrated powder that I use uh, rather than fresh because it's more consistent. It's going to give me the same color every time, the same moisture in my dough every time. So there's a lot of products like that that are available now that help in making the products more consistent. There's a science end to the manufacturing, uh, which a lot of them will need help with as well. You know, how do you keep it stable? How much citric acid do you put in there? What stabilizers are going to have to put in there? And that's going to be a little challenging for incubies because they're used to making something off the kitchen stove. Well, now getting it to taste exactly the same when you're required by law to put in, you know, a certain amount of citric acid or other preservatives in there, then that will change the flavor profile over time as it sits on this, the grocery store shelf. So these are all challenges that they're going to have to work through as well. All right, are you ready to play a little game? I am. (laughs) Okay, this game is called Out of the Frying Pan. Here's how it works. I'm going to ask you for a series of rapid-fire recommendations. You just tell me the first thing that comes to mind. Uh, And we're talking about the Portsmouth area. For people who don't know, where where exactly is Portsmouth, Rhode Island? Portsmouth is on the Quidnick Island, so we are on the far end of the island uh, away from Newport, which is on the water. So about how many minutes away from Newport? About 20 minutes separate the two towns. So not far at all. And and how far from Providence? Well, let's put it this way. By Rhode Island standards, that's far. Right. Yeah, that's true. We have a little state <laughs> complex here. <laughs> how far outside of Providence is Portsmouth? 25 minutes. Okay. So not far at all. Let's start with this. Um, if I'm looking for a place somewhere on the island with a great view, a restaurant, where would I go? Boathouse in Tiverton. Uh, right on the water overlooking the Mount Hope Bridge and the Sakonic Bridge. Uh, sits on the Sakonic River, which empties into the uh, Narragansett Bay. And then you have the Roger Williams University straight across the bay from you. How about a great first date restaurant? Is that a great place to go? My wife took me on a first date to Scales and Shales down in Newport, Rhode Island on Thames Street. And that worked out well? That yeah, worked out well. <laughs> Do you have a favorite place for brunch? Oh, in the Castle Hill, Newport, Rhode Island right on the mouth of the harbor. They do a very nice brunch a la carte, and I believe they have a buffet as well, and uh, really good uh, mimosas. You can sit out uh, at the bar, you know, look out over the harbor in the bay. It's uh, right there. Obviously, you're right there on the water, so we got to ask about seafood. Do you have a favorite place to go for seafood? If you want fried seafood in Bristol, uh, I think Quito's does the best job, and they're right in Bristol, Rhode Island, which is just over the bridge from us here. Talk to me about some of the places you go locally for ingredients. Do you have farms that you use that other people could maybe visit and and get ingredients if they wanted to? You know, I have a great resource about 400 yards from me. It's called the Castro's Farm Stand. And they actually, the family owns the largest farm on the island here. And they bring in a lot of their own fresh produce. And if they don't have it, if it's not the season yet, uh, Tom DeCastro... It's very good about bringing in from other local farms, even as far away as western Massachusetts. So uh, he's a very good source. Also, Sweetberry Farms in Middletown is a very nice spot for uh, a lot of fresh ingredients. They actually have somebody there now who's cultivating wild mushrooms. Do you have a favorite local chef? You know, I I like what Cy does at the Wolf Tavern and also the guys at uh, Persimmons and Bristol. I think both do a a really nice job with their food there. Both of those guys, by the way, are involved in the Taste Trekkers Food Tourism Conference. Yeah, I I think they do a very nice job. Here's my last question, since you're a pasta guy. All right. And, And be careful how you answer this one. You know that the former mayor of Providence, Rhode Island, Mr. Buddy Cianci, has his own marinara sauce. Yeah, I know that. Can we get your opinion? I've never had it. You've never had it? Seth, I'm going to be honest with you. I've never had a sauce out of a jar. (laughs) 
All right, we'll take that as an answer. I'm a purist at heart. I will go and cut up some tomatoes and shallots and garlic and fresh basil and, and do that before I'd ever open a jar. All right, then. My father would roll around in his grave. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Thank you for playing. You survived uh, out of the frying pan. You did a fantastic job. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us for this interview. This has been great. And uh, I'm really excited about all the projects you've got going on. You really do have a lot going on there. We do. We do. But, you know, it, it, it keeps us young. So let's walk through them. Uh, if people want to visit uh, Fatigati's Fresh Pasta in Portsmouth, uh, the address is 1965 East Main Road. Where can people find that online? Uh, Fatigatisfreshpasta.com. And then, uh, like we said, Hope and Maine, you can find online. You can easily just Google it. Well, thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to meeting you at the Taste Trekkers Conference, and uh, best of luck with everything. Thank you, Seth. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. My name is Seth Ressler. This is the Fine Dining Podcast. A couple of show notes before we go. Uh, first of all, you can find links to many of the things we talked about in this episode over at tastetrekkers.com. Uh, while you're there, you can subscribe to the show in iTunes or in TuneIn or Stitcher Radio or anything like that. Please leave a review if you do. That helps us out quite a bit. You can also follow us on Twitter, Taste Trekkers. Uh, we're on Facebook as well. And if you want to be a guest, you want to come on the podcast and talk about the culinary scene in your area, just click the Contact Us link, send us an email, and we would love to have you on. Thanks so much for listening. This is the Find Dining Podcast. You can find links to the places mentioned in this episode at tastetrekkers.com. Tastetrekkers.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>